This morning, I had the opportunity to talk to Jennifer Blunston from Myofunctional Fitness. Go check her out. We delved into what myofunctional therapy is, and it's a topic that I have come across but not really had insight to, despite working in the sleep industry for nearly 10 years. And it's all about oral posture, and who knows what that is? In this episode, you'll find out. We're talking tongue, we're talking breathing, we're talking better sleep, we're talking for behaviours to look for in your children to ensure that they have a good life, good performance and health for longevity. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and I look forward to hearing your questions. Reach out to me or Jennifer on our social medias. Yeah, because it started out with my son, who was born in 2004. My husband's a dentist, so he mm. recognized that my son was breathing through his mouth a lot, was nasally congested. He constantly sounded like he had a cold. Uh, he was developing a really gummy smile, which I didn't realize was, was not correct, um, that people that are developing gummy smiles, it means that their lower jaw or their uh, mandible is dropping back. And there's okay. a reason because of that. And it's typically because of improper tongue posture. Um, he started to have behavioral issues at school um, and was diagnosed with attention deficit. Um, their answer right away was medication. And we wanted mm. to look into other avenues. And so we started inspecting sleep. Um, we In kindergarten, we put a nasal strip on his nose and sent him to school. And we did that for a few nights. And then the kindergarten teacher came to me at the end of the week and said, what did you do to your son? Like, he's more focused this week. He has more attention. And we said, we put a nasal strip on the kid. Like he can't yeah, breathe wow. through his nose. So we ended up doing a tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, his turbinates, which is the tissue inside your nose, that when the air comes in, it slows down this air so that it can humidify and moisten the air. His were 50% enlarged. Yeah, so okay. he really couldn't breathe through his nose. So once we had all those issues addressed, some of the behavioral components a few months later post uh, healing started to resolve, but the attention uh, issues were still kind of there. Yeah. So we kind of lumped that to that, that prefrontal cortex, which is involved with motivation, behavior, control, learning, that that mapping wasn't happening correctly while he was sleeping because he, he had sleep apnea. So uh, he right. wasn't getting that, that rest and, and, and recovery. So then it's like, huh, you know, kind of putting the dots together, you know, could other children have, you know, behavioral issues? Could it be a sleep issue primarily, which is misdiagnosed or maybe not even diagnosed at all? Um, so that's kind of what got me down the path of, of seeking myofunctional therapy because my background was coming from a chemistry degree um, mm -hmm. and I was an educator in that field. And so I kind of just totally changed my, my course and, uh, and became a myofunctional therapist. Did you think you found more meaning in that work because it was obviously really relatable to your, to your family? Yeah, it was really relatable to my son and to myself. I was a mouth breather as a kid. Yeah. I had a high narrow palate. I couldn't breathe through my nose. Um, I did braces, but they, they took four of my teeth out, permanent teeth, and did retractive orthodontics, which is pulling. It made my palate even more narrow. And, you know, the base of the, the sinuses, the nose, is the palate. So if the palate is narrow and crowded, it's very difficult to breathe through your nose. So, you know, fast forward years later, when I met my husband, he said, you know, the reason why you can't breathe through your nose is because you have a high arched palate and we need to get that corrected. And so, you know, late in, into my uh, late thirties, I decided to do orthodontics all over again. I do my own myofunctional therapy for myself, um, expand my palate. And one day after expand, expansion for after a few months, it was like, oh my gosh, I can actually breathe through my nose and keep my lips closed. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a personal adventure too for myself that, that I've kind of been on and what I've realized for myself and my own health. That's, that's really fascinating because you know, I've, been, I've been working in the, uh, the sleep industry and been pe treating people with sleep apnea for, for nearly 10 years now. And it's, it's not something that I've come across until recently. And um, I think someone, someone messaged me on Instagram a while back or started following me on Instagram and I started to look into what it was and I was like, huh, there's some there's alternative therapy here that I've never heard of for sleep apnea. Right. It seems like it's something that we can do without having to go on a machine, without having to put a, a, an oral appliance in. 
Um, and then you reached out and said, hey, like, uh, do, you know, do you know much about this? And I was like, no, but I'm really keen to learn because what I think I can potentially utilize this conversation with is to try and integrate this into practices in over Australia and maybe use this interview for that. Um, so what, when, thank you for sending me over the, uh, the e-books and the literature that you sent over. I was, I, was, sure. I, was in, I was interested to read those. And basically what I wanted to talk about today is uh, poor oral posture. Now, it's not something yes. that many people, people think of poor posture, but not poor oral posture. Can you just describe what that is and maybe what causes that? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, people often think of overall body posture, but if you ask them, well, where's your tongue in your mouth? They have to stop and think because it's just such a habitual thing. They're not thinking about it. Um, but poor oral posture is typically caused by either maladaptive behaviors or by environmental factors. So maladaptive behaviors could come from when you're young. So thumb and finger sucking, extended pacifier and bottle use, uh, lack of breastfeeding. So breastfeeding uh, not only obviously provides the baby with nutrition, but it promotes nasal breathing and mm. correct uh, sucking and swallowing mechanisms in, in, in the face and in the, in the uh, oral cavity. And what this translates to is developmentally correct posture as the child grows older, right? So if I'm having a soother in my mouth, my tongue is down. A bottle in my mouth, my tongue is down. I'm sucking my thumb, my tongue is down. Um, and then that just can lead to other behaviors as the child gets older, lip licking, nail biting, uh, open mouth posture, um, congestion and rhinitis is one of the, the key factors too in determining whether someone's going to be breathing through their mouth. So I tell my clients, you know, noses are for breathing, mouths are for eating. You wouldn't eat something through your nose. So why would you breathe through your mouth? And they'll say, oh, I've, just, I've been breathing through my mouth forever. Like, you know, I've always been a mouth breather. It's like, well, where did that come from? And so that's where the questionnaires and the conversations begin. Well, were you breastfed? No. And I had a tongue tie, which was released when I was a baby, but I think it grew back. Um, you know, I was bottle fed. I sucked my fingers till I was seven years old and no one corrects that. So basically the tongue just then adopts this low posture, the muscles in the throat and the face then become adapted to that maladaptive uh, posture. And no one ever says, Hey, guess what? Your tongue is not in the correct position. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of some of the main causes. The other thing is ergonomics too. I mean, especially now through COVID, there's lots of Zooming and phone conversations, texting, kids are um, wearing heavy backpacks. Um, mm. All of those things leads to forward head posture. And if my head goes forward, then I start turning on those accessory muscles of inspiration, like the scalenes, the sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius. And then I'm kind of stuck in this forward head posture. And what that does is it alters my breathing pattern. And then I become more of a chest breather, less yeah. diaphragmatic. And then my tongue starts to adopt this low position. As soon as my tongue adopts a low position, it's very difficult for me to breathe through my nose. So then my mouth opens. So if you just do this for me, so try and put your tongue against the roof of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And open up your mouth and try and suction it up like a suction cup. And now breathe through your nose. Oh, wow. That was really easy. Breathe. Okay. Now do the same thing and then breathe through your mouth and see what happens to, to your tongue. So get your tongue suctioned up there. And now breathe through your mouth. What happened to your tongue? It tries to go down. It, it drops right away, yeah. right? So yeah. when my lips are closed and my tongue is up, that promotes nasal breathing. Ah, uh, okay. 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 So is that because so it's creating it, some kind of pressure change at the back of your throat correct. and pulling your epiglottis open? Exactly. So it's called negative intraoral pressure. Uh, so okay. I don't maintain that negative pressure when my mouth is open. Because if you just open your mouth, where does your tongue go? Boom, automatically yeah, yeah. it goes down. And if my yeah. tongue goes down, it also tends to adopt a more posterior position in the mouth. So then it's, it's taking up part of the airway space. So now I've got an airway that's partially blocked. And to overcome that, the body simply moves the head forward to open up the airway even more. So it's this vicious cycle, this repetitive yeah. cycle that is hard to break, right? So you get a child who's come from some of those maladaptive behaviors mm -hmm. Um, and now no one's explained to the parents that, you know, your child should be breathing day and night with their lips closed, their tongue should be resting against the roof of their mouth. Then that leads to teenagers and adults who have improper breathing, improper chewing and swallowing, um, and no one has corrected that, right? Yeah, and, and, and 
I'm guessing from the you know my lack of knowledge, and I, I would say that I've you know gone through a quite an extensive amount of education in sleep. That there's many probably many doctors and GPs and and even sleep physicians no out there that have no idea that this is no idea. Um, and it's and it's quite significant reading the literature that you sent it across. There was like you know the, the stuff you do can result in a fifty percent drop in in AHR. Yes. And also in snoring as well. Like, mm. um, you know, Professor uh, Guimeno, Christian Guimeno, um, who's a French researcher, he, um, him and Bill Demont, Dement were the fathers of sleep apnea, the fathers of sleep medicine. So they coined mm. the term obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and he, before his passing in 2019, uh, Professor Guimeno was a huge advocate of restoring nasal breathing and restoring proper oral posture. So what is proper oral posture? So we know, you know, what does bad oral posture look like? It's mouth breathing, it's audible sighing throughout the day, it's having crooked teeth, um, lack of tone through the face, um, an asymmetry in the face. Maybe someone's chewing only on one side of their face. So then they develop more muscular mm -hmm. tone to one side, lack of muscular tone to the other side. Um, you know, maybe they're drooling with an open mouth on their pillow at night. Um, they have venous pooling, which is dark circles, persistent dark circles under the eyes, because the sinuses and the, conge <laughs> the, sinus and the, and the congestion can't clear. Because when my okay. tongue is against the roof of my mouth, it acts as a lymphatic drainage pump. So every time I put pressure against the roof of my mouth and I swallow, there's four pounds of pressure there. It's quite substantial. Mm. So that helps the body drain the lymph and drain the, the congestion in the sinuses. And so then I get this persistent congestion through here, which shows up as dark circles under the eyes. So these yeah. are the kind of things that we start seeing in kids, right? So what is proper oral posture? It's my lips are closed at rest. My tongue is up against the roof of the mouth, making three points of contact. The tip is touching behind the front teeth on the palate where you say the letter N. So where N. your tongue tip yeah. lands, that's, your, that's the, the start of it. Then the rest of your belly or the body of your tongue is up against the roof of your mouth, about two thirds to three quarters. The back mm -hmm. could never be all the way up because that's again, impeding it into my airway, right? And then I'm breathing about eight to 10 breaths per minute. Um, and that's, and with a good cervical posture, that's proper oral posture, right? Yeah. So I'm but sat most here people, right now, just, I'm sat yeah, here just, now. You just kind like... of think like, where is my tongue in my mouth? You know, is it down? <laughs> is it kind of hanging in the middle? Is it up against the roof of my mouth? So that's kind of where the, the posture should be at. And he recognized that if someone doesn't have that posture and they have any issues with sleep breathing disorders, that if we can improve the oral posture, we can also improve the airway. Because like you just said, when my tongue is up, it creates that intraoral pressure. It keeps my airway open. It keeps my mm. airway patent. So your tongue is really the most flexible component of your respiratory system, okay. right? Yeah. It is part yeah. of the respiratory system and the main muscle, which is, you can feel this big muscle underneath your chin here. It's a fan shaped muscle. That's what anchors the tongue into my mandible or into my lower jaw. That's, that's called the genioglossus. That yeah. is what allows me to stick my tongue out. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's a breathing muscle. Checks so the vagus nerve, one... isn't it? Yeah. Is it, is it stimulated by the, the vagus nerve? Breathing muscle that really no it's not stimulated by the vagus nerve but it's a breathing no. muscle that is basically active when we're um asleep so if they check okay. muscle activity in the throat the genioglossus yep. is slightly active and the reason why is because it's trying to put your tongue up and forward into your oral cavity so that it's not dropping back into your airway right so if i have forward head posture all the muscles in my neck, so you have your hyoid bone, which is above mm -hmm. your thyroid. It's kind of like a, a U-shaped, like a horseshoe-shaped bone. It's the only bone in our body that's free-floating. So it's held in place by all these muscular attachments. And the tongue is inserted into the hyoid bone through several muscles. Genioglossus is there as well, right? So if my tongue is down, all this musculature begins to become weak. And then, you know, tack on the forward head posture. So I've got muscles above my hyoid and below. So there's supra and infra hyoid mm -hmm. muscles. Those need to be toned to keep a patent airway. Okay. Right. So when I have forward head posture and this becomes really weak, when I go to sleep at night, 
I need that genioglossus muscle to be active to mm -hmm. help keep my airway patent, right? And if what if I you couple that with breathing through your mouth and snoring through your mouth while you're asleep? So the muscles are paralyzed. That's what happens in REM sleep, right? So we don't act mm -hmm. on our dreams. We get yep. paralyzed. So now I have no musculature here that's really working. I'm in my deep sleep. My genioglossus is really weak. And now I go to lay down on my back and my tongue drops back in my airway, right? Then you hear that choking, gasping. You might get turbulent airflow, that kind of thing. So, you know, when you say a myofunctional therapist treats really oral facial uh, dysfunction of the muscles, we don't necessarily treat sleep apnea, but we treat yeah. the musculature that's involved uh, yeah. with keeping the airway patent during uh, sleep hours, right? So by changing the tongue position, we can um, help keep that airway open. And just by evolution, we're, we're you know, bipedal creatures. We have an airway that's collapsible, right? So mm -hmm. every time I breathe in really hard, this tube goes skinnier. It collapses due to negative pressure pushing in on the sides of the walls of my airway, right? So yeah. if this is not active, I'm not going to have a patent airway and it's going to be more susceptible to collapse while I'm sleeping, AKA the snoring, upper airway resistance, sleep breathing disorders are compounded with poor oral posture. Yeah. That's fantastic. No, it's, um, it definitely sounds like something that should be at the, the forefront of anyone who has snore and sleep apnea, because it's, uh, it's like personal training for your, for your airways. It's, um, it, it is. It, in an essence, if you're trying to get someone to lose weight, you, you know, you know, the first thing you're not, you're not going to go and do is put them on a bariatric surgery and tie up a knot in their stomach is you know, you're going to go, okay, well, let's look at diet and exercise. So if someone's got sleep, sleep apnea, the first port of call should be, okay, is there anything that's therapy wise or functionally wise that we can improve? Um, yes. and I, appreci I appreciate you talking about this. It's, uh, I, I didn't realize you know, how, how important this could be to, to definitely some of the people that I see. So w when you when you see someone, how would you, you know, let, let's take you take them through the process that you would actually go sure. through with someone. Maybe, yeah, you, they've already, you've already recognized poor posture. You've already recognized yeah. that's causing some snoring and some sleep issues. Um, how, how would you manage that? Yeah. So, so initially the intake is about two hours long. So we do a combination of uh, photos. So intraoral photos. So the teeth, the palate, um, the airway. So we do what's called a mal and patty score. So have, do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. So you, we do the mal and patties. Yeah. Yeah. So you just, you know, you stick your tongue out, you see, can I see to the back of the throat? And if I get a mal and patty score of four, I can't see any of the archway of my soft palate, my uvula, my tonsillar area. I can't see any of that that person is more susceptible to having uh, sleep apnea or sleep issues. Um, and that's because the soft palate isn't toned. The soft palate can be low and droopy, kind of like what you're saying. It's like, I need those exercises to tone that area and strengthen that area. And if I elevate that soft palate, then I actually be able to see the archway there, right? So I look at a bunch of things like that. Um, I watch people walk. Um, I do some, some gait analysis as well, which I've just started getting into. Um, and then I do chewing and swallowing activities with them and see how they're chewing and swallowing. I look at breathing. Um, and then I take shots, postural shots too, in terms of their overall body posture. Cause just like we talked about the forward head posture, it, what, what was it that caused that, you know, is it the tongue position, which is affecting the forward head posture. So that usually takes about a couple hours. They also go through some sleep disordered screening questionnaires. So if I need to refer them to a sleep physician or a dentist who does uh, dental sleep medicine, then I can refer them out before I even, you know, consider what's going on. I want them to get a sleep test mm -hmm. and make sure that we can rule out, um, you know, obstructive sleep apnea or any, you know, central sleep apnea, that kind of thing. And then once I kind of get all those, you know, pieces of the puzzle together, then I can come up with a very tailored plan because some people are, you know, the swallow is okay, but the tongue posture is not great. Other people are tongue tied. So I need to also refer them to a dentist who can release that tongue tie, right, going forward. And sometimes I won't even do myofunctional therapy unless that person's willing to go do expansion and orthodontics of the palate. Because if, you know, anatomically they're limited and they can't actually fit their tongue up against yeah. the roof of their mouth, a lot of the exercises I'm going to try to give them are going to be pointless. I need them to be, I need to set them up for success, basically. 
so tongue tied is is it is that where the, the underneath that tongue gets too too tight and you can't actually raise the the tongue up or you can't really move it too much? Exactly. Yeah. So everyone has what's called a frenum, a lingual frenum. So lingual for your tongue and frenum. Yeah. It's that line underneath. Everyone has one. For some people, it's tighter. And if it's tighter, it's actually pulling my tongue down. So it's a connective tissue. It's part of our fascial system. It's pulling that tongue down to the floor of the mouth. And then I physically, if I, as much as I want to try, I can't actually get the tongue to the roof of the mouth. And one of the important things I tell people, it's not enough to just say, oh, my tongue tip is on the spot, like you told me. But I need, I need like 75% of your tongue up against the roof of your mouth because it's the back of the tongue elevated towards the soft palate which dilates my airway and keeps it patent and open and also is what is important for swallowing. So many people are not swallowing correctly. That's another key component of looking at if someone has what's known as a myofunctional disorder, which means the patterns of their muscles are improper due to mouth breathing, forward head posture, thumb sucking, all these uh, you know adaptive behaviors that we talked about over time, they have issues with chewing, breathing, and swallowing. So we've kind of lumped those together as what we called orofacial myofunctional disorders or OMDs. And in order to treat an OMD, you would come to see someone like myself who would do all these assessments and say, okay, you know what? You're not swallowing correctly. Um, you know, you swallow a thousand times a day. And so yeah. you want to make sure that that's done right. So if I'm not swallowing correctly and I use a lot of my facial muscles, which is often the case with someone who has a myofunctional disorder, They'll use their facial muscles to swallow. So when you swallow, so many things are happening. It's quite a complex process. But if, if I just, you know, gather enough saliva here and I swallow, there, you didn't see anything. All you yeah. might see is something going down my throat here, but nothing is happening in my face. You know, people will take a drink of water. They'll pool all the water in front. And then all of a sudden they'll do this. They'll use all these facial muscles. So buccinators are cheek, mentalis is our chin, uh, abicularis oris is the band of muscles around our lips. They'll press those together and use those to kind of get that liquid to the back because the tongue is not going up in order to right. adequately get that liquid or that food to the back of the throat for you to actually swallow it properly. So we look at all these things and say, okay, now what do we do from here? So if that person has no nasal obstructions, they don't need to go to an ear, nose and throat doctor. Um, you don't, they don't need to do an expansion. It's like, okay, we're ready to get this myo started. It would be uh, several phases. So the first phase is once a week for eight weeks. So it's quite intense and they're doing exercises that are like isometric and isotonic. So I'm getting them to do holds, um, you know, with certain frequencies, repetition, the right intensity, um, and typically it's three times a day and they're doing them at least two hours apart. It's like anything with the gym, you know, you wouldn't work out all day and expect to see yeah. growth and muscle and recovery. Right. So I need, I need to break it down. I need to wait for the repair and they need to go back in again. So they would do visits with me about a half an hour, each visit once a week for eight weeks. Then we go to every few weeks, every two to three weeks up until the six month mark. And then for the last six months, we go into like a maintenance phase we're at the six month mark. I reevaluate and look and say, okay, what's the swallowing like? What's the chewing and breathing like? Where's the tongue posture at? What other things do I need to give you to keep this? And it's based on the concept of neuroplasticity. So our brains are not static, they're plastic. We can change our brains based on exposure to some type of experience. And those experiences are the exercises that I'm going to give them. And then they would do them, of course, at the right frequency and intensity uh, for so many months. And because it, it takes a long time to elicit change in the brain, often therapy can last anywhere between 12 to 18 months. You know, 12 okay. months is the typical. It's usually about a year of therapy because then all the patterns we've established with the muscles, with the swallowing, with the tongue posture against the palate, all that just becomes habitual. So the old ways of, you know, chewing with their mouth open, their lips are not closed, those kind of get forgotten. Those neural pathways get forgotten. And then we just keep reinforcing the new habits that we want. Uh, I guess that's um, a lot of it's easier if you're picking this up at a younger age then with the neuroplasticity sort of thing. Then obviously yes. before 23, 24, 25, you, you can change the brain by just repeating the behavior once you get about 25 and onwards it's a it's much more challenging process it is and people you know especially with kids you know as adults we have 
we're limited in our time. Of course, everyone's working, they have jobs and so forth. So I find compl compliance is a compliance based thing. It really is. It's like if you injure your knee and you go for physio, you know, if you don't do your exercises, are you going to see the results and the change in the musculature? Pro likely yeah. not. Right. So, so there needs to be some type of accountability, you know, so, yeah. we, you know, we try to work off of, you know, email, um, you know, I text people check in if I'm not seeing them once a week and it's great because the, that first eight weeks it's important to see that person once a week because I'm their accountability partner. I'm their accountability coach. And that's where we see loss of su success. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, accountability is a huge thing. Here. You know, if you're trying to get people onto CPAP therapy, if you just give it to them and say, Hey, go away, they would not use it. They'd abuse it the first night. They'd put it down. You'd never see it. Never see them again. But, yeah. And, you know, and that's, if you can get them back in, see them at day two, call them day two, day three, get them back in a week later. It, it's, it's it's about forming that relationship to say, hey, I'm here to support you, um, but then to guide you through this as well. Um, I'd love to hear any kind of like, what sort of results have you been able to achieve? Any real success stories that you, you, you've you had in any of the particular patients that kind of stick out to you? Yeah. So, you know, years ago when I first started this whole process back in 2015, I had a young girl. Um, she was, I think, five at the time, four or five at the time. And her mother brought her in for a, what's called a habit elimination. So she wanted to stop sucking her thumb and she had a huge open bite, which means like I had, she had a huge space between her top teeth, front teeth and her bottom teeth. You could literally stick a few fingers in there. right? <laughs> um, and that was where her thumb was at. And so she did the malfunctional therapy. She was a great patient. Um, and fast forward, once she finished her just, just not sucking her thumb. And I said, don't come back to see me for like three months. And then we'll start myo. She would, would have been approaching more like six years old. Usually we don't start myo before six or seven years old. You want them to have enough cognition and enough, you mm. know, ability to be compliant with the exercises. Um, so she went away for a few months after, you know, habit elimination and came back and her teeth were, the gap was closed. So oh, just wow. by removing the tongue, like we didn't do any therapy just by removing the tongue. Um, it was amazing. And she was a mouth breather because of the thumb sucking. She had been turned into a mouth breather. So in the winter time she would come in and there would be a huge red ring all around her lips from her licking her lips all winter when it was really dry. It's very, very dry here in Calgary. And, um, we started myofunctional therapy and she, within about a year or so she finished, I just saw her like fast forward, I guess, four years later. And I just saw her, she came in for, cause I work at my husband's clinic several days a week. And so they said, oh, Athena's, you know, she's getting her, her, this done and whatever. So I went over and saw her and I said, you know, smile for me, sweetie, beautiful smile, tons of spaces between all of her teeth, which is the way it should be when you're a kid. Um, and I didn't even talk to her until I walked in the room. She had headphones on. She was sitting, watching TV lips were closed. And I said, great. Like, this is awesome. Like this has stayed. And I asked her, I said, how are you swallowing? And she said, Oh, my tongue's up all the time. I sleep with my lips closed. My lips are closed all the time. So it's like getting that child when they're so young and able to do that. She, you know, she may never need braces, hopefully. Mm. And it's like, that's that win that it's like, thank God I intervened in there. And she was able to, to comply and do those exercises because she was really the one who did the exercises, right? Um, so that was great to see. I recently just started a patient a few weeks ago who's been in pain for 30 years she's had a headache for 30 years. Yeah. Um, she had an incident where she broke her orbital socket in the nineties, but she's always been a mouth breather. She's always been a clencher. So day and night she's clenching her teeth. Um, she had an orthotic made, um, which is like a, a removable retainer basically for just her bottom teeth. And it looks like teeth actually. So that when she goes to rest, she's not in pain anymore. So that kind of helped her pain a little bit. And she had that done a few years ago and she came in with her son. So I've been treating her son who's been tongue tied and he started having these great results. And she came to me one day and said, do you treat adults? I said, yeah. She goes, I think I need to come see you. I said, okay, let's do it. So she came in for assessment and we start it. And I think we're about, uh, I would say about five, six weeks into treatment. Her pain has diminished by 50%. Oh, wow. So, you know, and she used to have severe headaches, you know, maybe four of the seven days a week. And now she's at about two That's out fantastic. of the seven days a week, you know? And so for that, it's like, that is a huge win. And, and she, you know, I talked to her massage therapist and the massage therapist said, whatever you're doing, like, I need to know about it because she came in one day and I asked her how she was. And she said, I'm good. 
And I was like, oh, she actually said she was good and she wasn't in pain, which was a, a big deal. You know, and then oh, briefly, huge. I just, I had another, yeah, it's huge, right? And then I had another lady recently who um, is healthy. She runs, she does yoga. She's uh, quite physically fit. Um, she, um, you know, goes to see a naturopath. You know, she's very proactive. She didn't realize she had a tongue tie. She's not breathing correctly. Um, and she kept saying, you know, I have so much, uh, you know, bloating and gas and IBS symptoms. And so we started treating her. And within two weeks, she contacted me and said, all that gas and bloating and burping that I'm constantly having is pretty much gone. It's pretty much non-existent. So what was happening was when she was going to swallow, she was using her facial muscles and her tongue is pushing forward on her teeth. So her tongue never, ever goes up to her palate before when she was swallowing. So there's this body of air that's sitting above her tongue. So she just uses her facial muscles and kind of the sides of her tongue to miraculously get her liquid and food to the back of her throat. And in that process, she's ingesting all of the air that's sitting on, it's called air aphasia, that's sitting on top of her tongue. So every time she goes to drink or eat food, she's also digesting air, <laughs> trying to digest air. Yeah. And so once she started to change the tongue posture, that completely went away. So she that's said, you know, I've been seeing... It, it's, it, she said she was seeing tons of different practitioners and no one could figure out what mm. was causing her issue. And she spoke to her mother and her mother said, do you still have all that gas? Did you have stuff going on? And she said, no. She said, well, what happened? Well, I went to the dentist. Now I went to see a myofunctional therapist and this is what happened. Like my IBS and my, my gas and bloating symptoms are pretty much subsided. That's one of the, the main things that we see when we're treating people with uh, sleep apnea is, is pe people get in air aphasia or, or swallow in the air. And yeah. you know, there's, we, we, it, it's a constant battle to go, okay, is it too much pressure? Is, it, is the pressure not enough? And then people are having apnea and it's causing them to swallow the air. Yeah. Um, but I guess yes. it's never, we've, because, because we don't know about my, my functional um, uh, therapy or fitness in general, it, 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 that's probably something that I potentially need to look into, that have a look at, uh, okay, the individuals who are on CPAP therapy who are getting air aphasia, let's look at their mal and patty and go, is there, a, is there a link between the two there? Yeah, totally. And, is there a correlation? And, and I know hmm. there, there's combinations of masks, you know, one that go over the whole nose, and then there's ones that go over the mouth, there's ones that just go over the nose. Hmm. So, you know, I don't know, but potentially, you know, could you, if someone did myofunctional therapy, could keep their lips closed and put their tongue up and only the air from the CPAP is actually going in through their nose, mm. right? Would that help with the symptoms? I don't know. Like this could be something that you could look into. No, I'm definitely going to, I'm going to send this, uh, this, this podcast and video over to my, the CEO of the company I've just finished working with. And just cause he's, he's very open to holistic approaches to treating sleep apnea. And, and yeah. this is, uh, this is something that I've not heard of. I don't know whether you've ever heard of, but the literature you've sent to me is definitely stand out. And this conversation has definitely been stand out for, for something that we can put as a complimentary, uh, it's therapy. Totally, like an adjunct. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it makes sense that if you can bring someone's, and I, say, for example, you put someone in an oral appliance uh, to keep their yeah. jaw forward at night time. If you can do exercises throughout the day, just once a day, twice a day, to then try and actually get your body to be able to do that automatically. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and it will it, change the, the whole musculature of the, because, mm. you know, I think people, like you said, people don't know about oral posture. Many people don't even, you know, doctors don't know about this mm. stuff, which is, it's just crazy. And that's why I just, I this information because more people need to know about this and different allied health professionals. But, you know, especially if you have that forward head posture and your tongue is not sitting up against the roof of your mouth, then your breathing mechanics are altered. And then as soon as I start getting a tight chest, tight traps, and I start breathing thoracically, then I'm not breathing as much through my diaphragm. Then I start oral breathing, and then I'm not breathing as deeply into my diaphragm. So I'm not getting a proper, uh, you know, oxygen gas exchange, mm -hmm. oxygen uptake, all of those factors play into it. And then just alone by my lips closed, sealed, my tongue up, breathing through my nose while I'm sleeping is going to activate the diaphragm. And as soon as I activate the diaphragm, it stiffens those 20 muscles in that airway, which is around that hyoid bone. And that stiffening of the muscles keeps that airway patent. So if yeah. someone has poor body posture, even if their oral posture was corrected, let's say, but then their body posture wasn't addressed, that could still be an issue. So that's why I try to look at the whole person and say, 
what else does this person need? So myofunctional therapy is really interdisciplinary. So, you know, as a personal trainer, if I can't get this person back on track in terms of, you know, lordosis, kyphosis, all of this, I'm going to send them out to massage therapists, to a physiotherapist, to a chiropractor. So we work closely with chiropractors because your C1 and C2 are often, the position is often determined by where the tongue is at. And so if it's off, we'll often send them to a chiropractor first, get that straight, straightened away, and then bring them back for therapy. Because now I've got a good slate to keep, to keep going on. And many patients who have had to keep going for chiro and going for chiro because they keep going out of alignment, their cervical posture, they'll start doing myo and they'll say, actually, I'm finally not, I'm not having to get adjusted every week. Mm. I can go a month now without having to get adjusted. And it's because we're stabilizing that cervical area with the tongue being up against the roof of the mouth. Yeah, it's fascinating. The, the bit you touched on where you talked about um, you know, the mouth breathing, the lack of oxygenation because you're not using your diaphragm. I was talking to uh, a Professor George Dallam over at Colorado State University um, over yes. the last few weeks. And he's, he's at the forefront of research with athletes in terms of nasal breathing versus oral breathing. Right. And one of his one of his hypotheses is that when um, is you know, we get a lot of endurance athletes who get uh, myocardial, myocardial scouring. Uh, and yes. some, sometimes, you know, just in the European soccer championships over here, there's a, 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 Dem, a player from Denmark who's had a, a myocardial infarct, his heart, the cardiac arrest, sorry, on the, on the pitch. Right. And yeah. he has a hypothesis that that's due to, at high intensity exercise, mouth breathing is actually pulling uh, oxygen away from the heart because we're, because it's not being utilized properly. So it, it, it aligns in with with that sort of stuff as well. So I'm wondering if in athletes, if we're looking at the oral, the oral kind of posture of, of athletes, then their ability with their, you know, their myofunctional fitness in athletes as well. Is there anything, any literature around athleticism and performance related to this sort of stuff? You know what? I know um, Patrick McEwen, who I trained with to do the Boteco breathing certification. Yeah. I, I know there's in the Oxygen Advantage book, I know he has some references in there with regards to athletes and nasal breathing, you know, at mm. some point, if you're doing high intensity interval training, like the HIT, um, or you're sprinting, it is going to be difficult to yeah. keep you've got that, to offload that CO2. You've got, you've you've got, got to, to offload the CO2. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you just can't, it's, it's almost impossible, but for moderate, um, you know, activity, I would think that it's important to keep just from the research that I've read, it's important to keep that tongue up because mm -hmm. your tongue up is setting the stage for your whole body posture and your gait. So if I'm doing an activity where I'm going to need to do, have muscular control and coordination, do I want to do it with the mouth open with my tongue down, or do I want to do it with my lips closed and my tongue up? So they're even doing research now. I was reading this one research article. It was, I think, from 2015. I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. And they were looking at, like, you know, uh, squatting, um, you know, athletes and uh, electrical activity in the muscles in the lower extremities while the lips were closed and the tongue had proper oral rest posture. So yeah, okay. what effect does that have on, on, on it? And then also to just the breathing alone, you know, if I'm chest breathing and I'm not having my lips closed, I'm not engaged with that diaphragm, then I'm putting my lower back at risk. Like mm -hmm. I think about uh, weight lifters, like heavy weight lifters and stuff like that. And I think when I'm watching them, it's like, are they, do they have their lips closed? And it's, you know, is their tongue up? Because that's going to engage the correct breathing pattern because mm -hmm. a lot of the breath is going to the back and people think, oh, it's all in front. It's all up here in the lungs, but it's actually going into the lumbar. It's, it's supporting my spine. And so if I have clients who are quite physically fit, they're runners or they work out at the gym quite frequently, I'll try and design a bit of a program that they can integrate because people don't want to do something else outside their habitual patterns. They want to kind of have it woven in. So it's not something else that they have to do. And so for me, it's better to have compliance. If I'm like, Hey, you go to the gym four days a week. Yep. Okay. When you're weight training, this is what I need you to do. I need you to keep your lips closed. And I need you to keep your tongue mm -hmm. up. And then if they're out of breath, what I have them do is breathe in through the nose and only through the small hole as if you're blowing out candles on a cake. Or we'll do breathing behind the brace, which is breathe in, breathe out, brace the core, and then just keep breathing in and out, but the core is still braced. This yep. really provides lumbar support, as you know, and then that person can get through that challenging weightlifting exercise. But if they start getting breathless, what I'll have them do is a thing called many small breath holds, which is a buteco exercise. So it's just in, out, you plug the nose for three seconds, release, breathe in and out through the nose for 
five to 10 seconds, go again. And they'll do that between their sets so that they can recover their breathing quicker so that their oxygen uptake can be better because I'm keeping in more carbon dioxide. And now I'm delivering more oxygen to the muscles in the extremities and I'm actually working during my workout session. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of um, breath control and breath holds recently because uh, I just finished reading Oxygen Advantage and I've been following Brian McKenzie and the guys yeah. at Shift Adapt and their work. And um, yeah, I, I firstly, I just I, about eight, probably about eight to 10 weeks ago, competed in a powerlifting competition. So you know, obviously when you do max weights, you, you have to take in a big breath load. Right. engage that engage that core so you've got the intrathoracic pressure but also your yeah. diaphragm's contracted as well um but one of the things i've started to teach myself to do is first breathe in all, all the way through the nose so you get it deep into the lumbar you get it deep into the you know into the diaphragm and yes. then your final breath through the mouth to top the upper upper thoracic so it's like a yes so then you can get that extra bit in and it's almost like your whole body core is then tense because yes, it's only one, it's, what is it's one rep then um and yeah so that's just because I, what i see a lot of people doing is just going <gasps> just up into the upper chest and again the diaphragm is not contracted the actual yes, core not itself engaged. is not embraced um and a, a, wearing a belt helps with that as well and i know some people actually wear belts when they start doing breathing retraining to try and help them breathe into yep. their you know into the diaphragm and things like that um yeah so it's a very interesting area and I've, I've learned so much from you. Like you've Thank just, you. like, you've just uh, all the stories that you've managed to put with it and the descriptions and how you've been able to relate across. It's been really um, uh, fan fantastic for me. Uh, I just want to, I just want to try and go and leave it with some, I guess, takeaways. If you were to, yeah. let's go for, 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 a ch uh, if you're, if you're an adult, you're a parent like yourself and that you, yeah. what you observed in your child, uh, your son, um, if there was just a few things that you would be to be mindful of and you were watching out for in, in a child's behavior to ensure that they don't develop the uh, you know, poor oral posture and breathing issues and sleep issues, what would you, what would you be what, just a, the main things you'd watch out for? Yeah. So the main things I would watch out for is, you know, obviously the open mouth breathing is a big one. Any, any habits that, you know, were maybe still unresolved in children. Um, also looking to, to see, you know, do they have any space between their teeth? Young children should have space. It's called leeway space. Everyone should have space between their teeth when they're kids, because that means there's going to be room for bigger permanent teeth to come in. You know, so if they're already really crowded, it's like, mm, why are they crowded? You know, and children that age might not be able to tell you where their tongue posture is at, but watching them chew, are they chewing with their mouth open? Do you see their tongue coming out of their lips as they're swallowing? Are they using lots of facial muscles to swallow? Most parents don't, don't recognize that even in themselves. So watching their kids while they're eating, watching their kids while they're sleeping. I tell parents, be sleep detectives, go into the bedroom and take a video of your children dead asleep in the middle of the night and see what comes up. Um, are they thrashing around when they get up? Does their bed look like a big trashy mess? Cause they've been all over. So, you know, lots of leg movements and rolling over that's disturbed sleep. What's causing that disturbed sleep? You know, listen to their speech. Is it hyponasal? Does it like my son? Does does it sound like they kind of have a cold or they're congested mm. through their nose? They're blowing their nose all the time. Do they complain that they're blowing their nose? So these are kind of some of the red flags. Uh, waking up with night terrors, for instance, or bedwetting past the age of five. These are things that because then you get this aneurysis, which is that bladder fills up quickly if I'm breathing through my mouth. So these are little things that, that um, red flags or screening tools, I guess, that parents can use to look for that in their children. Say, you know, do they have correct breathing and do they have correct oral posture? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then is there anything, obviously not, not everyone's a myofunctional therapist specialist, but if you were, if you're an adult and you were to see those behaviors, what are those maybe small things you could do just to help improve just a couple of those? Is there anything that you would, um, as a parent, would you be able to do? Yeah, I think, um, you know, going through, uh, you know, eliminating pacifiers and soothers as soon as possible, right? Um, you know, either donating it, throwing it away, put socks on their hands, create a reward-based system where every day that they wake up and the socks are still pinned to the pajamas, they get a prize. And within about a week, the habit's done, right? So it's all, it's no negativity. It's all reward-based programs. Mm. So doing a habit elimination by themselves at home, like you can find this information easily online. Um, also to no, not using sippy cups, right? Get rid of sippy cups. Uh, for adults, I hate those Contigo cups with the straw on top. I tell all my adults or even any of my patients doing Mayo, it's like, 
get rid of that, get rid of straws, because typically I'll say, well, where's your tongue? Oh, it, it touches the straw. It meets the straw. Mm. So right away, there's a tongue that's down, right? I'm creating that maladaptive behavior by just using a straw or a sippy cup. So it's yeah. like, just have a regular glass that with a lid that you can unscrew and drink that way. Um, you know, make sure you're, you're, they're breathing with their lips closed, address any nasal congestion issues, take them to uh, an allergy specialist, take them to a doctor and say, can I get a referral to an ear, nose, throat or, or, or an otolaryngologist? Can I get a referral so I can see about, you know, congestion up there for my, my child? Do, do I need to remove any tonsils or, you know, get those turbinates, um, you know, dealt with? You could also do nasal rinsing. That's like simple, easy things to do, like Neil Med rinses, saline sprays, unblocking the nose, getting rid of that congestion. You can buy Myo tape now online. You can get it through um, Patrick McEwen's uh, website. You can buy it through Auction Advantage or Buteco Clinic International, myotape.com. It's just a little uh, piece that almost is like kinese tape that goes around the lips. And just by virtue of tension, it's holding the mm. orbicularis oris muscle just lightly closed so that those lips remain shut during the night. So there's nothing over the, the mouth so the child can still open their mouth so parents don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, there's this big piece of tape across my child's lips while they're sleeping and they're a little bit panicked about it. It's like this myotape is, is a safe way to have your kids be breathing through their nose. So the rule of thumb is if your child can sit there in the daytime breathing through their nose for two minutes and their lips are closed, right? Then they can breathe through the night. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, give your child some water and say, here, I'm going to set a timer. Let's play a game. Let's see <laughs> who can get the water out first and yeah. get them to hold the water. Instead of just saying, can you sit there with your lips closed? They won't do it. So if they have water in there, they'll sit with their lips. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll sit there with the water. It's like, oh, great. You got to two and a half minutes. Let's see if we can get to three, right? Playing games with your kids like that in terms of lip, lips closed. You know, I'm going to race you to the playground. Can we keep our lips closed while we're doing this? So just simple, fun activities that parents can do with their kids. You know, can we bike ride the first five minutes with our lips closed before we get hot and mm. bothered about it, right? So simple things like that, just promoting that lip seal. Is my tongue up? Um, you know, chewing is like, I think people had better oral posture way back when, because there was, your parents were hard on you Chew with your lips closed mm. and sit up straight, right. Without realizing they were affecting oral posture. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So doing simple things like that, um, I think can make a world of difference. Thank you. There's some uh, beautiful takeaways. Uh, yeah. uh, I think the, the view, the viewers and the listeners are going to get some, some real value from this. I know there's a few people that have asked me questions about thumb sucking and how that affects sleep and whether it's good or bad. And I uh, had a, you know, what one guy say, surely thumb sucking is good because you're breathing through your nose, but you know, you've just said, no, don't, it's not because it's going to change the shape of your teeth and where your tongue is and uh, all that exactly. sort of stuff. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, and, yeah. And the thing with the thumb sucking is it's hard to get rid of the habit because mm. you have a trigeminal nerve, which innervates the eye, the upper jaw, and the lower jaw. And a branch of that ends at the spot on that end spot where you put your tongue tip. That's where it's supposed to go. And so when I press my tongue against my palate, I actually stimulate my pituitary gland to really serotonin, dopamine, all uh, the feel good chemicals. Yeah. So when a thumb is pressing and having pressure, against the roof of the mouth, it's doing all that. It's, it's, you're going into a parasympathetic state. And mm. so that's why kids get really addicted to the thumb sucking and have a hard time getting rid of it. So we just learn to, you know, take the thumb out, replace with the tongue. We're good to go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. I've appreciated this conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, just before we, um, no, we, we jump off, just uh, if people want to contact you or, or get, get sure. hold of you, how, how can they get in touch? Sure. So they can, uh, so I just recently uh, launched my new website. It's myofunctionalfitness.ca. Um, they can also reach me on Instagram at myofunctional underscore fitness. And my email is super simple. It's jen, J-E-N at myofunctionalfitness.ca. So anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always there to, to answer any questions. Absolute pleasure to talk to today, Jen. Really appreciate Perfect. it. Perfect. Thanks, Martin. I appreciate it.